I suppose there is no one who, at some time or other, has not gone to a friend, a neighbor, or a relative for advice. And civilization has followed this general pattern since the beginning. We have always turned to our fellow creatures in time of trouble if we feel that that person is capable of being of practical assistance. And many are. And uh, in the days before the rise of professional psychiatry and psychology, the uh, favorite source of inspiration was the <coughs> local minister. And uh, if he wasn't quite able to handle some practical problem, there was nearly always someone in the community who had a reputation for solving things. Usually the solutions were simple, direct, and obvious but they were backed by years of experience. So we may say that in the problem of seeking counsel or help, we must try to find persons capable of providing experience information. Too many uh, people trying to help someone just tell what they feel about it. Or if I was you, I wouldn't do that. There is no particular background of insight. The individual who is giving the advice has probably never faced that particular type of situation, and if he has, he may have handled it badly. So the problem of trying to help people, as uh, George Bernard Shaw remarked on one occasion, is the most dangerous occupation that we know. We can get into trouble that way, and of course today trouble is not taken as it used to be, as something expected and almost inevitable. Trouble is now the basis of litigation, lawsuits, broken homes, ruptured families, and almost anything you want to think about. So here we are gathered as a group of people trying to improve ourselves. We want to grow, we want to find out a little more about the values of life so that we can live better. In order to do this, we must search in many cases for some outside assistance. Perhaps we will read a book that we feel has a good answer. Or we discuss it with someone whom we regard as authoritative or informed. But always the individual who gives advice has certain responsibilities that he must face. In other words, in order to give advice, it is very definitely necessary to examine our own inner natures. Why do we do this? Is it because we really feel that we are informed? Are we actually able to handle the situation that is brought to us? Or do we try to bluff through on some platitude that has never worked for ourselves? So we have to be careful that we are not uh, trying to play an instructor when we lack the information necessary. It is very important that those who give advice examine their own natures and find out how they themselves have handled difficult situations. Unless they are able to prove conclusively inside of their own minds that they can make a valid contribution to the problem of another person. It is much better to simply decline to pass judgment because we may be only adding to the prevailing problem. Actually also, most people like to be suspected of being capable of handling problems for others. We like to feel that we have a certain leadership that we have a sphere of influence over the lives of those around us. This is really a little more than egotism. It is just a certain sense of self-satisfaction. It has nothing to do with the facts. But if by any chance we are personally ambitious to be recognized as a source of information, that we may often go beyond our natural abilities. We will answer questions that would never uh, meet the requirements of our own experience. Things that never could have happened to us, 
we will try to pass judgment on or tell someone else how to take care of the situation. This goes on year after year, and nearly every family has in it somewhere an advice giver who nearly always is the one most in need of advice themselves. <laughs> they may be well-intentioned, good-natured, kindly people, but many of them simply try to advise by imposing their own temperament upon the other person they are trying to help. It's one of the most common introductions to an advice cycle is, if I were you. Well, this in itself is a dead negative. The other person is not us. Our way of doing things may not have any bearing upon theirs. And may be well to note that these people who have been giving this information have done what they would have done under certain circumstances, and it came out badly. Therefore, this type of advice does not work. If we are in positions where we know that advice is necessary, we can look back on the family patterns of long ago. Hundreds of years back, maybe thousands of years back, the primary source of strength was a family unit in which two and sometimes three generations were alive at the same time. These three generations formed a basic experience pattern which they tried to share and pass on to the young. These close family patterns were based upon the common experience of the family unit. The advice given would be applicable to the people for whom it was given. They would be part of the same situation that had caused a father or grandmother to come to certain conclusions about life. So the in the family unit, it was a more or less self-protecting thing. There were very few religious arguments 500 or 1,000 years ago because most persons belonged to a community of religious life which was suitable to all of them. So in those days, the elders were probably the source of instruction. This was true in the American Indian psychology. The uh, wisdom of the tribe was vested in the olds. The olds were either alive or had gone, but their wisdom lived on. When anything went wrong and there was doubt, the problem was carried to the elders and the elders in council attempted to assist the solution. The elders were those who had lived long, had been through much, had suffered a great deal, and had gradually integrated an inner life that was secure and proper. And this wisdom they could pass on to the young. And the young in those days were very happy to get it. They were quite aware that they were sharing in a, a continuity of convictions, that as it had always been solved before, so it would be solved again. So the Indians really had a very tight way of approaching this particular problem. They had the medicine priest, and in the Indian philosophy, medicine meant sacred. And all problems were brought to this sort of mystic elder, whose word was law, whose decisions were final, but in all cases were based upon the old wisdom of the people, the people who had gone before, those who had lived long, who had labored hard, and had died bravely in the defense of their tribe. So this type of wisdom became the basis of guiding new generations now, the younger generations uh, were not too difficult to guide at that time for one very important reason. They respected the olds. They respected because they saw every day the value of the wisdom that had been accumulated from a lifetime of experience. These young people did not question because in their hearts and minds they knew that the elders were better informed at the proper solutions to problems. Now, of course, this is very largely broken up. There is no such a pattern anymore in most cases, although among a number of Amerindian groups, 
the re-establishment of this concept of counseling has been more or less re-established. It is uh, this close contact with the natural problems of things that helps to make the proper uh, counselor. Now the Bible, the Old Testament particularly, has it to do with the prophets and priestly ones of old. There were those who out of the wisdom of years or by mystical experiences within themselves were wonderfully gifted and even the rulers listened with great attention and were careful not to offend those upon whom the Spirit of the Lord had descended and had given them jurisdiction over the acts of mankind. Now these old priestly ones were not just simply wise in the professorial sense of the word. They did not speak from an academic background. They spoke from the experience of the ages. They spoke also from a lifetime of constant service to their fellow man. They did not have many ideas of their own. All the ideas that they had had been handed down in the scriptures or in the teachings of the fathers. So there was a, again, a kind of descent of infallibles. Things that always had worked, things that always did solve, and which the new generation was willing to apply to their own problems. As the family ties broke and the situation scattered, a great deal of this wisdom has been no longer available to the average person. So today, if we have a problem on our hands and we want help, we cannot simply ask somebody. We cannot take it over the fence with the neighbor. We cannot go down the street into a friend who plays bridge with us on Tuesday evenings. These are not the ways in which we can hope to find solutions. Of course, the first problem, when, when faced with difficulty, is to look inside yourself. If you can be completely honest with yourself, you are the best counselor you will ever have. But many people are not capable of that degree of impersonality. They are bound to sit on one end of the scales where they weigh a problem. Instead of following the fact of the problem, they follow the implications that they wish to recognize. But if a problem arises, every individual should really say to himself, have I done everything possible to solve this problem? To what degree am I at fault in a critical situation that is developing? It is much better to do this yourself than to pay a thousand dollars for an analyst to do it for you. And he may come up exactly with the same answer. But the question first all of all is, can we solve it ourselves? Can we solve it perhaps with a little encouragement? Someone that we know and believe in can say, I think you can solve it yourself. You have the proper knowledge, you have the courage, you have the strength of character and the integrity to solve your own problem. Now this isn't giving advice, it is simply pointing up the possible potential of self-analysis. Well, if it happens that the problem could be within a range of self-analysis, then it's very wise uh, to take the position, in my situation, have I been doing what I should have done, or have I been doing what I wanted to do? And if these two are not the same thing, they can explain a great many difficulties. It is always in our way of, of thinking that we want to be happy, we want to be comfortable, we want to have every privilege possible to us. But the question then arises, how far can we carry this without damaging other people or debilitating our own ethics? Very often, if we think a little while, we can see why things have not gone badly. We begin to understand how a bad investment may have crippled us financially, perhaps only because we tried to get more profit than was reasonable. All the way along, the individual has to curb his own appetites. He has to put a certain restriction upon his own ambitions. He must live within the area of his own available intelligence. 
And if he does not do this, he is bound ultimately to come to difficulty. Well, you can look through the situation, and if you have a living parent or someone who is very close and has long been very fair in matters, you can perhaps discuss it a little bit with them to see whether they had discovered in you characteristics and traits which you have not recognized that you have. This does not mean that they will give you important or concluding advice, but they may point out how you can help to solve your own difficulty. Actually, we are all in this world to solve problems ourselves. Now, in a complicated civilization such as we live in now, it is not always possible to do this alone. We must call in help. We must do various things that will assist us in protecting our integrities and our normal rights and our responsibilities. Now, if it seems that you do need to have some kind of advice from someone else, then you must begin to estimate the type of person whom you believe uh, can give you the advice that you need. The present tendency is to be a little afraid of professional, technical advice. We feel that too much of this advice is simply given by the hour, at so much an hour, and that there is really very little basic understanding. Therefore, the psychologist is not always selected as the one to help in these emergencies. And almost anything that a psychologist can do without the practice of psychiatry is to try to help the individual to estimate the nature of his own character. He must realize that he is in his present difficulty because of what he is. He is not in trouble because others have, treat, have variously injured him. Maybe he is injured in some cases, but it's usually because he has opened himself to the injury. He is not actually uh, looking for an outside cure. He is looking for something that will help him to rationalize his own inner need. So if he goes to an advisor or a helping, helpful person, there are several things to be taken into consideration. Nearly all advice that is necessary for the intimate problems of living is involved in religion, either religion actually or through various phases of religious philosophy or religious practice. Therefore, the tendency may be to consult a religious person. That is often a good thing to do, but there is also something else that has to be def definitely considered. We must find someone who we know to be qualified to do the thing we need done. And for the most part, the religious advisor deals in platitudes. He tells you all kinds of abstract things, but he cannot provide the particular, detailed, specific information that will help you out of a difficulty. He also is apt to exercise more than proper authority on you because he is part of your idea of the religious image. To you he has special authority because of a religious position. And this authority may not in any way include the capacity to help you. Now the person on the other hand who has this authority may be very honest, very willing, and very kind-hearted. But has he ever asked himself whether he is qualified to give advice? I know one case that came to my own attention where a person who really believed that they were inspired by some overpowers, that they had been illumined in some respect, became a sort of counselor to a great number of persons over a period of years. And the result was almost completely tragic. The advice given was not the advice needed. The person giving it did not know what they were doing. But when the problem got difficult, instead of facing the fact that they had failed, they simply moved out of the community and went elsewhere and did the same thing. They left their damage behind them. 
or simply closed off contact with that which failed to meet their expectations. These people should have settled down quietly and tried to figure out why the advice they gave others did not work. And usually it did not work because the foundation of it was not realistic. The background of the information was not solid. It had to do with strange visions and psychic expressions and manifestations which no one could prove, but at the same time were passed on as solid facts. These solid facts evaporated, often leaving the victim worse off than before. So if you are going to be an advisor, it is necessary to prepare for the job. Now parents have to prepare for the job of advising their children, and more and more it is becoming almost a requisite that the parent is a very skillful thinker on a number of important subjects. The advantage of extra years in which to gain this information is also a deciding factor. But actually, if you hope sometime or would like to believe that you can really help people, that you can get them on their feet when they're in trouble, and if you believe partly in the Christian ministry of preaching to those who need, or giving advice to those who are forlorn, then it is necessary to have an adequate foundation on which to work. The individual who gives advice must be well informed in the area in which the advice is needed. Now it's obvious that no one can be well informed on all subjects. Therefore there are areas in which advice has to be very general or else it can become a, a misrepresentation. Actually, however, behind all of our thinking, there is a simple background which we can all learn and which we can all use in measuring the value of our own advice. Nature is governed by certain rules, by certain laws. The universal purpose to philosophy, religion, and even science is fairly well recognized. What the individual must do to survive is to obey the rules governing survival. The individual who wants to be happy must obey the rules that bring happiness. The same of health, the same of knowledge, even in sports, unless the person is willing to take the necessary training, he will not excel. So in every basic problem of life there is a generality in which advice can be passed on almost uh, without particular intelligence. But it is simply advice to keep the rules, to uh, keep the faith, to read the scripture, to follow the commandments of Moses and Jesus. And that if individuals will do these things, most of their problems will evaporate. But our to present generation is made up of people who have joined various religious organizations but have kept all of their previous prejudices. They are not really actually practicing what they preach or what has been preached to them. They have been newborn in some faith, but they do not forgive their enemy quickly. They do not do those things which would protect them against most of the troubles of life. If there is nothing else available to help a person or to give a person basic inspiration, probably the best thing is to suggest that they read the Sermon on the Mount. Because it is simple, it is solid, and it is something that has stood the test of ages, and it is also a, a high level of integrities from which we have constantly fallen. But these integrities will not fall to, to help us to survive. We must go back to them. All solution must be according to integrities. Nothing else will actually do any good. If a person has a problem, he must try first to find the source of it in himself. And if he does that, he probably will not have to go much further because he will find that what is necessary is a new attitude, a new adjustment, a new relationship with the situations that annoy him. So we have this problem now that brings it to a sort of philosophical ground. There is a school of thought that takes it for granted 
that if we dominate the thinking of another person, we must accept and assume ourselves the consequences of our own advice. Now this is a very unpleasant concept, and in fact it is it's one that no one really wants to follow. We do not want to give advice and learn later that the individual took it and his problems were worse than they'd ever been before. If we do hear this, of course, we have always the uh, traditional evasion that either they did not do what we told them to or else it was all their own fault, not ours. But where we pass on an influence strong enough to condition another person where through psychology of dominance or through some traditional background or through religious superiority, our influence becomes so definite that it is difficult to resist. And this influence goes bad. We are certainly in some way involved because I know a number of persons who have ruined other people's lives by their hasty advice, their dogmatic attitudes, and their unwillingness to practice the basic principles of Christian charity. So this problem brings into philosophical focus the matter of the responsibility that we have when we over-influence other people. And by over-influenced, we don't necessarily mean a good heart-to-heart -heart talk or something of that kind. But where we put behind that some strange psychic pressure, some mysterious factor, where the person giving advice insists that the advice is not originating with him, but is, was given to him directly by the divine hierarchies, this makes it very difficult for the other person to resist what is in fact a delusion. So that where we press an advice, supporting it with factors that are not true, or trying to influence and maintain this influence by exaggeration, or by threats, or by all kinds of misrepresentations, then certainly we are at fault. We are definitely breaking the rules of good living. We are breaking the rules whether we know it or not. Now many people who suffer do not know that they have broken the rules, but they are still suffering and sometimes they must face the fact that breaking the rules is the cause of suffering. So if a person trying to help another goes beyond the normal state of his common knowledge and attempts to press force or over-influence, he is going to take on consequences which may be difficult. A good example of this happened a number of years ago and a person who came to me, when they, a young woman, when she was in her early twenties, uh, had a romantic affair. The uh, family disapproved, of course, and uh, the mother particularly disapproved because she had already planned that in her older age the daughter was going to live with her and take care of her. With this in the back of her mind, she fought to destroy the possibility of a marriage. As a result of threats and petitions and hysteria and tears, and appeals to family loyalty and divine relationship and honoring the parents and all this, the girl gave up the romance. They lived together, the daughter and the mother, for years. The mother finally died, leaving a 65-year-old daughter who had never been out of his, her mother's sight. Both lives wrecked. The other, the older woman gone, the younger woman now beyond the age of building a home or having a normal relationship with life. Now the mother was moved primarily not by the fact that the marriage might have been wrong. She was moved by the fact she wanted to hold the girl to herself. She wanted to be able to dominate this person so that this person would take care of her in her older years. Now there's a good case for karma. It's almost certain that the older person will sometime have to face this because it was wrong, it was selfish, it was self-centered, and it was prejudiced. Now with these factors behind any bit of advice, we may begin to think in terms of karmic difficulties. We begin to realize that where ulterior motive influences the advice 
we are already making a serious mistake. The only way in which we can help is when our own affection, our love, our friendship is pure and uncontaminated. If we are trying to do it to improve our own condition, to win the confidence of people we wish to dominate, then we are bad in bad way. So we can say that karma comes in where there is a misrepresentation as to the importance of knowledge. That karma comes in where an individual is overwhelmed and is no longer able or permitted to think for themselves. This is one point where there's no question that the responsibility is passed on. This person will have to go through a similar experience themselves and will have to face the chances of being themselves exploited at some future time. Whenever there is an ulterior motive, it whiplashes and comes back at us. The, an, another phase of this particular approach to the situation is that we impose upon others the idea that we are like them and that they are like us in many ways where this similarity does not exist. This is the cause of the favorite statement, if I was you, and then the decision. But never has it been pointed out clearly that I am not you. And for that reason, the whole problem is badly com complicated. The uh, woman comes to her neighbor across the fence and says she is going to divorce. And the neighbor says, of course you are. You are certainly going to divorce. He's a ter perfect brute. How did you live with him this long? The other neighbor who knows he's a perfect brute knows it because the wife has told her. She may never have met the husband at all. He might be the perfect brute. You never know. But the neighbor advising, wherever an advice involves a situation that is not obviously constructive, must be taken with a grain of salt. It is perfectly right to say, if you feel that you need to separate, that is your decision. No one should interfere with it. If you want our opinion, we'll have to, we can't give it because we don't know. But somewhere in the great teachings of mankind, there is an answer to your particular problem. And when you get to that answer, you will find that it is constructive, idealistic, and inclined to help the person to grow. Comparative religion helps in this a great deal because many different religions emphasize different aspects of human relationship. And these different aspects can be applied uh, to the problem of the moment. And sometimes we can't find in the scripture just the answer we're looking for, but we can find it in one of the other sacred books of the world, set in a setting that is just as responsible, just as realistic, and just as honorable. So always we have to understand motives. It is motive in almost every case that determines the consequences of an action. It is the motive that causes us to seek help that becomes a very definite factor in what that help is going to mean and how we're going to use it. It is the motive to be a teacher or a helper or to gain a local reputation for omniscience that makes the individual say things that he shouldn't say. He also may also be influenced by a financial situation in which his uh, financial success depends upon agree agreeing with aggrieved persons who are willing to pay an exorbitant fee. So all these things have to be kind of sorted out. If we are parents, the uh, law is that we have the right to help these young people that we have a right to coach them in the things we believe is right. We have a right to chastise them in some way if they break the common rules of life before they're old enough to understand them. We have a right to try and make honest citizens out of our own children. We can do all that is possible. But also, it is very likely that the effort will be clumsy, extremely clumsy. We will simply demand obedience, 
and we will never question in ourselves whether the thing we wanted them to do was suitable for them to do. We demand obedience and allegiance and unquestioning acceptance, but when the child stands a few feet away and looks back at us, they find that they are not, we are not the responsible person who could hold their confidence. So there is rebellion where the conduct of the parent is not consistent with the natural integrities of a child. If these integrities are blighted long enough, they will then be corrupted also, and the trouble will spread, sometimes through several generations. Actually, then, all ulterior motives have karmic consequences. The only thing that has no negative consequence is that which is done with fullness of spirit, kindness of heart, and with all the wisdom, insight, patience, and temperance that we can possibly focus upon the situation. We must in no way try to over-influence. We mustn't fall back upon hypocrisies to strengthen our position. We must not try to plead uh, with a person on some religious grounds which is inconsistent with their believing. All of these side factors have to be faced. Now, advice is something that's uh, not really a mental thing at all after it's all said and done. Advice is an exchange of inner understanding. It is a communication on the level of the human soul. Uh, the advice that is given without love, without charity, without honor, is not advice at all. It is rather that we must recognize that as the deity, in one way or another, implants upon the face of nature all the truths that we need to know. And man, over the course of ages, has gradually interpreted many of these truths into words, sacred books, art, music, literature, philosophy, and science. Therefore, the, the great book of solutions unfolds around us all the time. We have to always try to move only from the deepest side of our own nature. This doesn't mean that we can't think, but it means that the real basis of our understanding is a subtle sympathy by which we find ourselves close to suffering and anxious to serve its solution. Any other motive will get us finally into trouble. Always we must realize that our own experience may not be ne the necessary thing for another person. We have to try, therefore, to gain as much understanding and insight of experience as possible. My uh, reactions to these things have been largely on the level of comparative religion. I'm a little worried about intellectual philosophies because they do get into trouble themselves quite easily. And the sciences ignore too large a part of the person. But in a mysterious way, uh, comparative religion will show us the good in many faiths and help us to find the answer to the problem that we ourselves face. The, uh, there's a story in Buddhism about the general of the armies who went to Buddha. And he said, Master, you, you teach peace. I am the sworn ruler of the armies of my king. I have sworn that I will defend the state. I will defend the liberties of the people. I will defend the ruler if necessary with my life. Now you tell me I shouldn't do, I should be a man of peace. And Buddha said, well, not necessarily. The, the dedications that you have, you have made voluntarily and you believe they are right, and you believe they are necessary to protect the state, and you believe, if necessary, that you will fight for the state to try to help it. That's all part of your way of life, with one thing you must remember. If that is the way you want to live, you must be prepared to die that way yourself. In other words, if you are a soldier, you must be prepared to face the, the dangers of that occupation, justified by your belief that it is right. But always any right 
that is not peace must be guarded by the fact that the person who it tries to fulfill that right shall take the same penalty that might be bestowed upon another by his own action. So all the way along you'll find little fragments in the teachings of Confucius, in the teachings of Lhotse, of Buddha, of, uh, of Muhammad, of all these teachers. There have been moralists among them, mystics in most of these groups, who have tried uh, to solve the problems of life. And they say, for instance, if you are a badly problemed person, if you have a great deal of difficulties and you don't know what to do about them, perhaps uh, the Coptic monks of the desert or some Zen monastery in the hinterland of Japan has something for you. Take your problem, perhaps, it's depending on what it is, and simply settle down to the organization of your own inner life. Depend more and more upon the spirit in you, and less and less upon your appetites. Cling closer to your aspirations, and do not be over-influenced by your ambitions. Little by little, cleanse the compound of your own nature, so that you are not concerned primarily with the gratification of any sensory perception, as Buddha points out. Your real purpose is to learn to get along peacefully with eternity, with the, ev with the everlasting rightness of things, with the eternal justice and the eternal mercy of the infinite. Do not try to get along with the false notions for which you may give your life, for which you may sacrifice your happiness, or break the responsibilities you have with family and home. Accept all of these things as they do in the Pure Land sect of Buddhism in Japan. The Pure Land sect says, do not go out and become a monk primarily until you have actually fulfilled all obligations of family. When your children are grown, when your children are well established, when your family is happy, and when your marriage partner has the same convictions and dedications, then settle down quietly to the unfoldment of your own inner life. Begin to think in terms of freeing the soul within you from all the burden of appetites, all the burden of false purposes, all the conflicts and competitions of society. Just realize if you can, and we all gain little by little the power to do this, that the great reality is the discovery of the eternal peace within ourselves, and that that peace is the form of deity that is most obvious in the complex structure of mortal bodies. So when uh, this type of thing comes along, you're no longer, you no longer try to be impressive. You no longer try to help people unless they need your help. I told you before about this monk who I think is a perfect example of a type of relationship. He had been a wealthy man and been a businessman, and the sorrows of life and the disappointments of life fell upon him. And he finally decided that his miseries were largely due to the fact that he was so definitely always trying to prevent himself from hurting, that everything had to be sacrificed to him having his way about things, and that when he didn't have his way, the persons who stood between were enemies, they were vicious people, uh, they were misunderstanding people, and he was just tied up into this pattern for most of his earlier life. So he simply put on the yellow robe and became a mendicant. And he made a very simple career out of being a mendicant. He went along the country road and he saw a house with a leaky roof. So he mended the roof, blessed the people and went on and charged nothing for doing it. In another house there was a group of people, someone was very sick. And the children were underprivileged and in trouble. And the house was run down and uh, many people were afraid to enter because of the ailment. So he just went in, washed the children, gave them baths, cooked the food, helped to nurse the sick person till they recovered, and then disappeared. He spent nearly 40 years doing this, from one place to another. His only desire 
was to serve. He never tried to teach them anything. He didn't have to, because he brought thousands of them to religion by the living of it. And there have been persons in all religions that have made these kind of contributions. And they are the ones whose advice is probably the most vital of all, because it is obvious that it is a solution to the greatest need of the human heart, the need to serve. So we watch these things every day, and we read in the papers, and we read the books about all the new things that are happening, and the, and the wonderful discoveries that are being made, and many of them are very good. But when we come to these problems and start reading the books, it might be very well for a person who is reading because he's in trouble to pause for a moment before he studies the cure recommended and finds out what the cure is inside of himself. If he is an alcoholic, <coughs> he does not need to read books on the subject. He has only one problem. He's got to get over the ailment or it will destroy him. There are many ways he can fight it and he can win. But regardless of anything, it is an action of his own. A thousand people can tell him to quit. But if he doesn't want to, he won't. Many people who are suffering, I know several persons today who are suffering from career problems. They are not willing to live within their own capacities. They have finally gotten up to be managers of a big business or one of the vice presidents or something of that nature and they are going to be miserable until they get the top spot. Well, in many instances, they are not suited to the top spot. And in struggling desperately uh, to tr transcend themselves, uh, they make enemies, they try to downgrade other possible candidates because they want that spot, and then in the middle of it all, they have a, a thrombosis or something of this nature. The system breaks down completely under the pressure of this terrific ambition. Now, you can tell those people to stop and look, slow down, take it easy. I know cases where families have pleaded with these persons to take it easy. But the ambition drive is just too strong. That ambition will end in trouble. It has to. But uh, when it comes to advising these people, you can say to them, yes, you're doing too much. You are not living the way you should. We can also suggest maybe a way in which they might be able to ease up a little on these problems. They have diversified. Many of these people have never had a hobby. They've never done any vocational thinking. Get them started on some kind of rest. Put a golf club in their hands and tell them to go out and get into the air. To do something else to help themselves along. Sometimes they will do it. Most often they won't do it. But we have no right to go in there and say to this individual, uh, it is divinely appointed that you play golf. <laughs> and we have it from the archangels that if you don't, you'll get into trouble. Man will probably then go back and if he doesn't do the things he shouldn't do, he'll be tempted to. So these things won't work. We cannot help people beyond the words of a few syllables. The things like the words of Christ, the Last Supper, or something of this nature, are very simple words. They're words that are supposed to go right past the mind and go into the heart. They are supposed to represent an inner dedication to values, a deeper spiritual insight. And they are always words of kindness, words that are not critical. Today we have a great world of people fighting each other, everyone afraid of everyone. And this, in the fact that we have in this world today probably a billion and a half Christians who claim to believe in the words of Christ, many of them have been baptized, attend regular church, go to confession, and receive extreme unction. But these, why do these people not ever seem to get around to the words of the person they consider to be God on earth, the personal only born of the Father, where he says very simply, love ye one another. Now everything else really in the form of advice fails because that is the basic advice. 
And on that you can build all kinds of relationships. You can make all kinds of interpretations of how things should be. You can build an elaborate philosophy to justify the proof that peace is better than war. But unless the individual finally realizes that the final bond that can hold humanity together, humanity together is love and nothing else, and that this love is sincere, that is the kind of love that will sacrifice self for the one who is the beloved. And if we will sacrifice ourselves for that world to which we belong, it won't be long before peace will be here. But while we continue to preach it, and nobody does anything about it, we are in the same position we were in before. Now comes the question, can we force this peace? Can we demand the peace? Can we assassinate anyone who doesn't keep the peace? Can we jail the person who is contentious? Are we ever going to be able to create this peace by a frontal attack upon the vices of society. France, chances are we will never be able to do it. We will never be able to do it because legislation cannot do it. And wherever legislation attempts to change natural temperament, we have the proof of the fact that karma is a responsibility that descends upon anyone and anything that tries to force a change in human nature. You can't do it this way. The change has to come from within the person. Deity knows this, or the universal system is aware of this fact, because gradually it forces upon the individual the need for self-correction. We, get, we avoid it as long as we can. We like to be selfish. We want to gratify our appetites and ambitions. But gradually, one by one, we come to this desperate fact that all of this competition has no significance in terms of space or eternity. All of these things come and pass away again. Everything that we have fades away. It is only that which we are that endures. And we want that which we are to be something we can endure in peace. We do not want what we are to be at war. We do not wish the faults that we allow to arise in the personality. We do not want them to infect the soul behind the personality and gradually corrupt all the peace and happiness that we can possibly hope for. So, we have to say to a person, First of all, make peace with the realities of life. Do it in your own way. But come out with something that you've done that you're proud of for the good of others. Remember the wisdom of St. Francis de Assis. Remember the kindness and thoughtfulness of the great mystics of the past. And try to gain the answer to your grief by rising triumphantly above the causes in your own nature which brought about that grief. Griefs are things that we all suffer from, but we recover from them if we have proper attitudes. Someone will say, I've had been asked a number of times, why don't more people have better attitudes? Well, one reason is that in our society, attitudes, good attitudes, are not taught. We are not taught from childhood that which will bring peace to ourselves and others. We are taught to take advantage of the weakness of each other. We are taught that we are still living in a jungle, and that in this jungle each individual must scratch his own way. But actually, there cannot be any peace in society until that peace is experienced within the heart of persons. Now, it doesn't have to be in everyone's heart at one time, but it has to be something that spreads, grows, unfolds, and enriches. And if it starts to grow, it can spread just as war has spread. It can become the spread of a great peacefulness, and gradually nearly everyone who has ever suffered will be glad to stop suffering. But it has to start within ourselves. 
So when you, someone comes to you and wants to know what to do about buying that new house or something of this nature, the answer is to take it inside of self. Don't ask another person for the answer. Examine the facts and you'll find the answer. But if your ambitions, your selfishness, or your cupidity is stronger than your judgment, you will not find the answer and will suffer the karmic consequences. All karma, basically, is the result of the wrong applications of energy in the processes of existence. And uh, whether it is our own energy that is wrong, or whether we coach somebody else to use their own energy badly to try to affect us in some special manner, the fact remains that the only answer is that doing it right creates no karma. Now you say, uh, well, maybe it should create good karma. Well, in a sense, I don't know whether you need to say it that way. We all say it. I've said it many times. But if we do nothing to cause bad, bad karma, the result is good karma. It is peace. We have done nothing to disturb the values of life. The values of life suddenly reveal themselves in all their natural beauty and their wisdom and insight. If we are not breaking the rules, we do not know there are any rules. If we are keeping the patterns of life correctly, life is a beautiful, natural experience. And we can face it with the strength of internal character. Certainly we will have our ups and downs, or we must have those, because we are part of a mixed society. But we will always have the internal resources to come out triumphantly, happily, and peacefully from the situations that present themselves. So we'll say that somebody now, in this pressure of things, says they all feel that they know exactly what somebody else ought to do. This individual doesn't want to do it, therefore he is stubborn, he is uh, ignorant, he is unpleasant, because he does not want to do just what we want him to. So we may find ways of trying to convert him, more or less forcibly. We may say to him, well, if you don't change your ways and do what I suggest, uh, you are not in our employment any longer. That is one way of putting a pressure on a situation. Another one is, if you don't wish to live in harmony with the laws of our family, get out of the house. This is another um, pressureful thing, which is a, a way of trying to change a person to meet our requirements. When in reality, we should only change people to help them to meet their own requirements. Then we may say, if you join this other religion, I will disown you. That is another mistake. Sometimes it goes so far as to say, if you do this particular thing, I'll kill you. It's still, it is this tremendous pressure, determination to change other people. But never giving these other people an example of the benefit of a better attitude toward life. The revenge goes on. It is never solved, never settled. The antagonisms build and build. And then we wonder why the world is in the trouble it's in most of the time. But wherever we try to force, it may not be so strenuously. But now there are many different doctrines floating around, which in a sense are perfectly all right. There's no reason why a person shouldn't follow the religion that is closest to his own heart. But when he joins something that forces him to change his own internal life in a direction he does not want to change it, then something is wrong. If this belief cause forces him to do things that he is not ready to do yet, and he tries to do them, he will be in trouble and the group will be the victim of its own bad karma. If this other group wants him to perform actions that are uh, unethical, uh, for instance, desert a family or neglect people, or to turn their, uh, their financial resources at the expense of family into some organization, these things are leverages 
in which a person is over-influenced, forced to do something, either by intimations or by actual threats, that, uh, is, that are not what he wants to do, then he is in trouble. And the only answer in that situation is, if what you are asked to do is below the level of your own integrity, refuse. And if the refusal makes you a, an enemy to the group, retire. Do not allow any belief, no matter how religious it may be worded, to cause you to break in any way the commandments in the Sermon on the Mount. Never compromise principles because human beings demand it. That organizations are built up which are contrary to ethics, that is their business. But we cannot afford for one moment to be over-influenced by them. So well, that is where your bad karma comes in. Now, if you have become associated with a group and it wants you to do something that you shouldn't do, and expects you to propaganda that group and influence other people to do what you do not believe, and you try to do it, then you are making karma. You are breaking the integrities of life. Now, karma is not just a penalty. Uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, most of the religions of the world that accept karma as a reality do not regard it as basically a punishment. It is a challenge. Karma is not something desperately bad that's falling on your head. Karma is a gentle reminder that you have done it wrong and that therefore it is time to rearrange your values. Karma is not something that curses you to the end of time. Karma is something that invites you by an object lesson to improve your own conduct. If you accept karma as a challenge of integrities and rise above it as such, you will find that there is always a silver lining and there is always a compensation for the improvement of conduct. So never think that conduct karma is like damnation or something of that nature. It is not even purgatorial. It is simply nature telling you that you have broken the rules. And that's because you have broken the rules on one level, you are physically ill. You're not physically ill because you were predestined and foreordained to be sick. You are ill because you have broken some kind of a rule of health. You are worried. Well, your worries are probably quite justified in some things. But if you worry and get headaches, it may be become ill then your worry is obviously causing a comic reaction because nature says you will not get far by worrying. Worrying is a destructive emotion and destructive emotions never re result in good. When the problem comes along, consider it, meditate upon it, study it, but never fear it. Try to do the thing that will take care of it simply. If it cannot be taken care of, learn to patiently live with it until it clears. But do not worry. Worry is a negative emotion. It will give headaches, it will give sickness, it will disturb your personal life, it will disturb your career and everything else. The same is true of mostly every negative attitude. You come through a life and you come in here and there's a drive in you of ambition. There is a demand for success that seems to be built into you. Well, that is in all probabilities part of the message that comes through from a previous life to remind you that you were trying to be more than you should be then and haven't gotten over it. Uh, when this type of thing comes along, relax, do the thing that you can do well, but do not strive beyond a reasonable point or you'll get nothing out of it but sickness. If in the course of all of these experiences you begin to flirt with justice and do things that are illegal, immoral, or unreasonable, then more karma comes into play. But if you correct these things, the karma ceases. 
And if you didn't do them in the first place, there wasn't any karma. And the individual who lives a simple, direct life is going to be the saint of tomorrow. In this world we're living in now, we're coming to the end of the 20th century. And we're coming into it in an awful mess. Now this mess is not quite as bad as it looks, we'll admit that. But it is something that is a great cause of worry and a great cause of anxiety. And we're beginning to see that selfishness is building up a debt that can never be paid. That ambition is ruining nation after nation. And that personal you know, selfishness is destroying populations. All of these things are very depressing and rightly so. But they all arise from the same simple fact, namely that we won't keep the rules. And because we will not keep the rules and do not want to hear about the rules, because they interfere with our personal fulfillment, so-called, we are in this position and we are coming gradually to the end of the century. There is only one answer to this problem, and that is to get back again to the basic integrities. There is no reason why these vast empires, monopolies, and aggregates should continue. There is no reason why baseball players should get ten million dollars a year. There is no reason for this tremendous urge for wealth. And again the words of Christ come into mind. That we should store up our wealth, our treasures in heaven and not in this world. Because anything we store up here will be destroyed corroded or, or stolen. So we can just simply begin to think that by maybe the beginning of the next century there will be a kind of fall. We fell once out of heaven and we fell into a serious situation if we can believe the biblical stories. But next time perhaps we will fall on our feet. Perhaps the next time we will realize that there are certain simple integrities which are the best for all of us. And that when we have these integrities, we can be happy, we can develop talents and abilities, we can unfold resources of consciousness, resources of art, music, literature, we can travel, we can do all kinds of things that are nice and pleasant. As soon as we stop this tremendous pressure for values that can never be fulfilled. So if we break the rules, it is not so much that we have been punished. It's simply that the blackbirds have come home to roost. We have done certain things, and we must re take the results of these things. And until we correct them, they will continue to haunt us. There's no use going to somebody else to ask them how we can survive gloriously the consequences of our own mistakes. There are a lot of counselors that will take on the job, though, for reasonable consideration. <laughs> uh, they will to tell us that we can do anything we want to do, and that all this idea of morality and ethics and so forth is something that is being used by the intellectuals to imprison the common man. That actually we can all be millionaires. The years ago there was a man said, if you really want to be a millionaire, all you have to do is keep your mind on your second vest button and make sure that your chest is pushed out against it all the time. This does it. As I remember, he died poor. <laughs> but in any event, we will have all kinds of advice on how to control other people, how to make the great steps forward into luxury, and extravagance. We will be told that our morality is an interference with our success, that integrities are old-fashioned and out of date, that what we should do is scurry around and get other people into as much trouble as possible. Well, those giving this kind of advice are the ones who are building up some pretty bad karma, because they are perhaps going to sometime have to live in a world which is not that kind. Supposing at the next century there is a major shift and simple honest values become important. We are no longer as so ambitious about everything. We're perfectly happy to live along in comfort and peace and quietude and that wealth will have lost all of its attraction for us. About this time those who have been preaching the importance of wealth and power and all those things 
will come in again with the same preachment and no one will be listening. They, no one will care. These people then will go through a terrible pressure of finding that all of their processes, all their willpower, all their determination is powerless against the common sense of an enlightened majority. The moment we become a little reasonable, all this unreasonable policy will vanish. The vast inflations will slow down the moment people think. And uh, when they th we begin to do this, then we will have what is called good karma, which is really just normalcy. And the, the bad karma is simply unwillingness to keep the rules. And of course the rules are all kinds of things. Everywhere there is a pattern. And if we want to study or we want to read or we want to examine into things, it might be good to try to a little basic summary of the basics of the various sciences, arts, philosophies, and uh, religions, that we find how it all started, and that these things are a kind of basic things growing up with us, and that somewhere in them we will find the answers to the problems that we need to know. It's very important perhaps to a scientist to put a, another ship on the moon or something, but it is also terribly important to cut down the divorce rate. We are going to find that we'll never be happy until we do the simple things well. And when we do the simple things well, we may discover that a lot of the difficult things are not necessary anyway. We are becoming too complicated. And in our complications, we allow infinite varieties of attitudes to destroy friendliness, to destroy companion ability, to make feuds that last for generations, dividing nations and races, and causing conflict everywhere. It's all just simply due to the fact we will not look inside of ourselves or understand the divine plan of things. It is because of this, in spite of all our feelings on the matter, that religion is probably the master of all arts and sciences. Religion is the most powerful thing in the world. But religion caught into this trap, also a prostituted in the name of profit and wealth and material power, has desecrated its own story. But beneath it all, the simple facts of the relationship between divine power and nature, between the human being and the universe in which he lives, and between each of us and our own neighbors, these spiritualized realities must be the basis of the civilizations that must rise if we're going to end this mess that we have made for ourselves. And even where it's a little difficult now, all of us, to a degree, can stop this reform motion if we want to. We can't ask and don't ask people to break up their whole way of life to change something, but we can find nice things beginning to creep in. We can find a little more friendliness, a little more patience, a little deeper and more satisfying love. We will find that domestic grievances do not necessarily have to break homes that there is always a way in which a greater love will mend a lesser one. There is no reason why we should be building always to defend ourselves against hate. These things, little by little, we can overcome in ourselves. We can reach out and cure a grudge that we've had for a long time. We can live within our means and not have the fear and anxiety of debt. We can give a little more time to the children if they want to, if we want them to give a little more peace to us in later years. Everything can be done the moment we begin to put values where they belong. And until we put values where they belong, we're not going to get the results. And anyone who tells us that we can have a peace we have not earned, a, pro a prosperity that is not firm in our own achievements, that we can be happy without deserving it, that we can be healthy and break all the rules of food, that we can be robust and everything and at the same time be on narcotics. Any type of instruction that does not demand the correction of the faults that have caused the ailment, any such instruction and those who carry it on 
will be part of a comic load that they have to carry. For if we do what they make us do, or impel us to do, or advise us to do, and it is wrong, we will suffer. And because they have made us suffer, they will suffer too. There's no way around that perfectly frank, reasonable, natural fact. So we, each of us should stop trying to prevent suffering coming from us to anyone else. We must realize that we do not have to accept the wrong attitudes of other people. In many cases we can transmute them. In any event, we can always meet them with a blessing regardless. They tell the story of the old monk in his cell who was copying a manuscript and all of a sudden the devil came up through the floor. And the old monk was so busy man working on his manuscript, they didn't even hardly look up. He just said, bless you, my son. <laughs> and when he looked up, it was an angel. <laughs> the difference was in himself. So until we know some better way of doing it, it's best perhaps for us to all bless each other and hope that we will not contribute in our own lives anything to the misfortunes of the world. Well, thank you very much, folks.